are continuing in the book of John. Remember, we are presenting Christ through this book. We're presenting him in a way so that somebody can believe in him. And we're going to progress through how Christ is brought forth to the world and starting off slowly and then eventually publicly and uh, which leads to his crucifixion. And you'll see that there is a timing issue of uh, how things went down and why the timing was what it was. So let's pray and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, another day to open your word and to learn. Lord, we ask that you would help us to grow in wisdom. Lord, help us to see Christ and how he was manifested to the world. Lord, it gives us confidence in who we are and what we have in him. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, our outline, once again, we're still at the first portion, chapters 1 through 4. Today's objectives, we will be in John 1, 35 through 51. Again, where we are in the outline, but we're going to talk about some chronological things in the book of John and uh, Jesus' first disciples that were called. So, all right, we're going to look a little bit about how the world was really in one geographical area, which is amazing because the world still today revolves around this pile of sand. It is amazing. The world's affairs revolves around Israel still. But when we look back on this time 2,000 years ago, we see really how they just kind of stayed in the neighborhood of this area. So John 1, 28 and 29 says, These things were done in Bethbara beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So, where are we talking about where John was baptizing? It's right here. It was beyond the Jordan River, which this is the Jordan River, right? So beyond the Jordan River, that's where John is baptizing. That is where Jesus comes to him. John 1.35, again the next day, John stood with his two disciples. Again, we have this chronological order of things that are going on one day right after the next. We don't just have this blanket period of time being talked about. Look at 1, 43 to 46. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, So where is Galilee? Look right in the middle at the top, the white box with the red border and the word Galilee. Galilee is where it says Galilee. I got it. All right, so there we have Galilee. Look at chapter 2 and verse 1. On the third day, so after those events had passed, three days later, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Cana of Galilee. Ooh, you know what? I could stay back here and point. Right there. There is Cana of Galilee. All right, so we have that. Now look at 2.12. After this, he went down to Capernaum. He, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. Okay? Capernaum. Right there. So Cana to Capernaum. Pop quiz. Why did they say they went down to Capernaum if it's to the north? Was it altitude? Altitude. When the Bible says, and it says it a lot, they went up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is literally higher off the planet than where they were. So you will see that throughout Scripture. So when it says that they went down to Capernaum, they literally went downward. They didn't go down in the holler like we would say down south. They went downward, meaning their altitude went from higher ground to lower ground. Good job. John 2.13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Where did he go? Up to. 
Jerusalem. There it is. All of these things are happening all in the same region, right? So they went up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is elevated. All right. Uh, John 3, 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Judea, if you look at the bottom, again, white box, red border with Judea. Judea is where it says Judea. I got it. All right. Good job, class. All right. Uh, John 3, 20... Uh, Wait, yeah, John 3, 23. Now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptizing. Where is that? <clears throat> right here. So you can see as they're making their way around, it's all around this region. And the world hasn't changed. A lot of things still revolve around that. All right, um, John 4, 5. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. So Samaria, where is that? Look right in the middle, white box, red border, red letters, it says Samaria. Samaria is right where it says Samaria. All right. Lastly, John 4:43. Now, after the two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee. Where is Galilee? That's got a white box. Doesn't it? And it says Galilee. Right there. <laughs> All right. So, uh, for me, it kind of helps because when they talk about all these places, you get these visions in your mind of like, well, I wonder what that looked like or I wonder where that is. But so many things happen in the Bible for a reason. And a lot of these places become significant, especially when you look at um, the geographical reasoning for things. When they came into the promised land and you have the battle of Jericho, if you go to Judea and go up to the right, just north of Jerusalem, the battle of Jericho, all of these stories, they happened in these areas. And it's really neat to do a geography study as you're studying the Bible you can get an atlas of Bible lands. All of this is on computer. When I was in seminary, computers were still the new thing. Um, so I have books at home, and they're really big, wide books of maps, and they have different periods of time. Maps that show places during the Old Testament, and then maps during the New Testament. But understanding where these locations are is pretty neat. Uh, it helps us to understand and get a visual of, of uh, again, all these places where they were going, where they were, how they kind of moved around. If you, uh, if you look at, um, Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, right? So you get these different areas where, uh, where people were from, and it gives you an idea. It was all around that area. Good geography class. All right. Let's read some texts, 135 through 51. It says, again, the next day John stood with, his, with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated, Teacher. Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah. Messiah literally means the anointed one which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called, a lot of times we were just talking about this, we say Cephas here. Their Greek word is literally kephos. So kephos, which is translated a stone. And so in Greek you have petros, um, is the Greek word there. So the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee 
And he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael, being of good attitude, said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That is our text. So let's go through here. John 1, 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When the Bible says that he had stood there, John had stood there, what's interesting, there's a little grammatical argument that could be made here. I'm not going to live or die by this argument, but in Greek, the tense there is called the pluperfect tense, which is a fancy way of the perfect tense, meaning it is past, but it has lingering effect. So the perfect tense is something that has happened, but the effects of it is still going on. And there are some scholars that argue that that wording is there on purpose to say, John stood and there was a passing of the torch here, where with him standing, there was a lasting effect of him standing there, and it was, behold, the Lamb of God. It was kind of a, a passing of the torch from John to Jesus, wanting him to decrease while Jesus would increase. So in the word behold, the Greek word ide means to look upon, experience, perceive, discern, or beware. So when he's saying behold the Lamb of God, perceive him, understand who he is, look upon him. That's what we're talking about. Um, John 1, 37. Next, 1, 30. This is he of whom I said after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Moving down to verse 37, the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them followed, said to them, what do you seek? So, 137, the two disciples made a decision to believe and follow Jesus. John the Baptist faithfully turned them to Christ. This is what every believer, especially leaders in the church, should always strive to do. If you watch what I call kind of the religion buffet channel, you watch it long enough, you'll get any flavor you want. Uh, when you watch these channels and you watch how popular and how grandiose the pastors are, question, do they have a sense where they are standing there on purpose to have the lasting effect of Jesus getting all the glory, Jesus being lifted up over them? There's a lot of pastors out there that turn people astray because they turn people to themselves. And then when they mess up, people are lost. They don't know where to go. Where the pastor messed up, where the pastor did something I don't like, so I'm out of here. Why? Because the pastor put himself in that spot. I don't ever want you to look at me as a divine person. I'm not. I am somebody doing my role in the body just like you're supposed to do your role. There is no difference between you and me. A light does not shine in my bedroom at night, and there is a portion of scripture that is illuminated. I don't hear the humming and singing of angels, and you don't. None of that happens. The only thing that makes me special is I happen to be the one standing up here, and you're not. That's it. 
God doesn't talk to me differently. God doesn't give me special visions. He doesn't do any of that. I have to learn the Bible and then turn around and teach what I've learned. And so I put in lots of time. I don't come up here and go, well, let's talk about stuff and go on a whim. I prepare every week. I put in numerous hours to come here and teach. That's the work that's put in. God has not enabled me to supernaturally know all of the Bible. In fact, quite the opposite. He tells me to study, to show myself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm given that. But there's nothing different. At our church, the board has the power and ability to fire me. Why? Because I don't want absolute control. I don't think that's biblical. I think I'm somebody who's doing my part in the body of Christ. So Christian leaders need to decrease and always make Christ increase. If you are following me, stop it. When I'm teaching you the Bible and I'm following Christ, sure, follow me. When I'm not, don't. It's always about Christ. The human person will always have sin in their life. And as a result, if you look at me as being the Christ in your life, shame on you. Christ is the Christ in your life, not me. I'm merely trying to get the understanding to pass on to you so that you can have the understanding with your relationship with him. All right. Now that I've thoroughly stomped myself into the ground, hopefully lifted Christ up, moving on. 138 and 39. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following said to them, what do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. All right, the 10th hour depends on who you are and where you are and all that kind of good stuff. The 10th hour, 10 a.m., starting at midnight. That's what we're used to. Okay, that is a Roman usage of time. The 10th hour in a Jewish calendar would be about 4 p.m. They start at about sunrise-ish. So other gospel and the other gospels, when they speak of time, are using the Jewish time. So if, they, if we were in Matthew and they said about the 10th hour, we would be talking about 4 p.m. John was not written to just a Jewish audience. It was written to the world. Rome was leading the world at the time. So understanding the time reference is important. Matthew chapter 20, give you a little instance here of the time understanding. Starting in verse 1, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarii, a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. Third hour. Was that three in the morning? No, that was about nine in the morning. Okay, it's a different hour reference. And said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. And again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. Sixth and ninth. Is that 6 a.m. and 9 a.m.? No, that's Roman usage. Jewish time is different. And about the 11th hour he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? Because the sun is down now. It's nighttime and they were standing there idle. So that gives you a little glimpse into the time gap. But to understand John 1, 38 and 39, you need to understand the time difference that was there. Jewish time versus non-Jewish time. And the book of John is written to the world. So he didn't just stick with Jewish time there. 140 to 42, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which was translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Kephas, which is translated a stone. So Peter, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Kephas, which means a stone. 
So here we have these three different names for the same guy. Talk about complicated. Simon, Kephas, and Peter. Simon, which is the Jewish word there, Simeon, is the original Hebrew name. Kephas is an Aram Aramaic uh, meaning rock. And then Peter is a Greek translation of the Aramaic name, which is Peter Petros. Have your heads exploded yet? But when you're, God bless you, I see that hand. So, um, so understanding the names, this is why. This is what was going on in the world um, at that time. Peter was a Jew, but then he was going to uh, reach out to the world. So this is kind of the breakdown of his name to give some understanding. All right, John 1, 43 to 46. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found uh, Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. All right, just by way of, can anybody find Bethsaida? When you find it, raise your hand. All right, you go to, up to the Sea of Galilee at the Jordan River, top right. This is where all these guys were from. So when it says Bethsaida, there you go. Isn't that nice? Philip and Nathaniel both knew scripture because they said, this is the one that we've been taught about, right? This is the one that Moses spoke about. 146, Nazareth. Jesus came out of Nazareth. Nazareth was known to have low morals and generally a poor town. I can make a joke about a town in Oklahoma, but one of you might be from it. So in my law enforcement career, I've had the opportunity to go around Oklahoma, and I've been amazed. Some of the, uh, the towns in Oklahoma, they're struggling. Uh, but just think of Nazareth, where Jesus was from Nazareth. Low morals, low run-down town. Nathaniel Bartholomew. We don't have to look at all those verses, but in the other texts, it'll use Bar Bartholomew, and the other Gospels, but it uses Nathaniel here. Nathaniel means gift of God. And the reason why Bartholomew is there as a name, because he is the son of Tolmai. How does that come into play? Well, during that time, Bar meant son of. So if he is Bar Tolmai, son of Tolmai, you can see how Bartholomew, Bar Tolmai, kind of the creation of that name. So that's how he got his name. Very exciting stuff. All right, 147. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. A little cultural reference here. Micah 4.4 4 says, But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. Little reference of sitting under a fig tree, right? Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 10 says, In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. Interesting. Go to Isaiah 36, 16. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make peace with me by a present and come out to me and every one of you eat from his own vine and every one from his own fig tree and every and every one of you drink the waters of his own cistern we have this cultural reference in the old testament of being under a fig tree or sitting near a fig tree and this was always a place of contemplation a place of peace as it's talking about those things that will happen under a fig tree, it was very common for Jewish people to go and to meditate under a fig tree because the scriptures made reference to those. So a little cultural reference when he's coming up and he saw him sitting under the fig tree and he's like an Israelite indeed. How is that? Because he's literally doing something that was culturally and biblically referenced um, with the sitting and meditating under a tree. Go to uh, Genesis 27. When he says, in whom there is no deceit, names don't quite mean the same like they used to in the Bible. 
Jacob in the Bible, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob literally means cheater. Jacob had to go his whole life with the name cheater. Wouldn't that be nice? That's like having the nickname loser. Hey, loser, come here. Okay. You know, and you have this your whole life where there is a name given to you, which means a deceiver or supplanter. Genesis 27 and verse 35 says, but he said, your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob because of the deceit? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright and now look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? So here you have this idea of a supplanter. Go to chapter 28. And verse 12, then he dreamed, talking about Jacob, then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So here's what people believe going back to John 1, when, uh, when it uses these references and he eventually uses the reference, you believe me, but pretty soon you will see the angels ascending and descending. The thought is, is that um, Nathaniel was maybe sitting under this fig tree and he was literally reading the scripture about Jacob. And so when Christ comes walking up and he says, an Israelite indeed, where there is no deceit. And he's talking about uh, to Nathaniel what he was literally just reading. Because in the same context, he uses the, the biblical reference, you will see angels ascending and descending on the Son of God. So it's a good cross-reference of what was going on under that fig tree. Uh, we believe Nathan or Nathaniel was reading that portion of Scripture where it's talking about Jacob. And so Christ walks up and he says, Behold, an Israelite indeed, who there is no deceit. And uh, that probably had a little bit of a wow factor of Nathaniel, like, how did you know what I was reading, you know? So he goes on, Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. That could creep some people out. You know, um, I remember that old song in the 80s. I always feel like somebody's watching me. Um, in our case, somebody is. God's watching us, right? But God basically demonstrates to Nathanael, hey, when you were under that fig tree, I even knew what you were reading on how I addressed you. But um, I saw you. So Jesus demonstrates his supernatural knowledge. In verse 48, I saw you. Before Philip called you, I saw you. Um, and then verse 49 says, Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So we have this idea where Nathanael is convinced in who Christ is, based on the supernatural thing that he just saw happen. 150, Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So here we have this foreshadowing of greater miracles. Because I said this, you believe in me? Man, you're going to see some really cool things that are going to blow your mind. If that's what it took for you to believe, you're actually going to see greater signs. And then again, back to that reference of Jacob seeing those angels ascending and descending. Um, he makes that reference. So, as we finish this context where Jesus is now being manifested to his disciples, he's making disciples, few things to point out. Uh, John honored Christ and pointed people to him. I stand up here and I tell you, I do not want you to put all your faith in how you're going to live your life based on me. I will probably do something to offend you someday. Don't follow me. Follow Christ. John the Baptist, immediately I stood there and there goes Christ and I want him to increase, whereas the pastor role to decrease. It's on me to be a good example. I don't want to set you up where you have to make that decision. I will do my best to lead 
by example of what it means to live for Christ. But I'm not the one that you need to look to. Hopefully my teaching is pointing you to Christ. Remember that. Always, always, always look to Christ. He is the fixed object that never moves. I'm an object that's trying to get better at not moving. But sure enough, something will happen where you can get offended looking at me. If it does, come and talk to me. You'll be amazed how approachable I am. We will talk through it. We will solve it. You will probably be right. And I'll go, you know what? You're right. That was a bad attitude on my part. I'm sorry about that. That's how we should interact. But Christ is always the fixed object. Jesus was mission-minded and gathered followers an intimate team. When you live your life, have a team around you. If you want to be a Lone Ranger Christian or a Lone Ranger person in life, good luck with that. You're going to suffer and struggle. Be friendly so that you have friends. Be loving so people want to love you back. Be Christ-like so Christ-like people want to be around you. When you don't do these things in life, your life is harder. I can't tell you how many calls I go to where somebody got beat up or something happened and the person who did the beating up is gone and by the time I get there, I'm there to do a report. Okay, I'm going to do a report and we're going to file charges on the guy that beat you up. And then I'll go, you know what, it's probably not a good idea for you to stay here because they may return and when they return, they may beat you up again. You got any family in the area where you can go stay at their house? No. Okay, well, sometimes that happens. Family lives away or whatever. How about any friends? You got a friend's place that you can call up and just go, hey, I got beat up. Things aren't good. I want to get out of here. That way I don't get beat up again. And people look at me and they go, no, I don't have any friends. Do you have any money? Can you stay in a hotel room for a night or two? No, I really don't make a whole lot of money. I don't have money for that. It's like, help me help you. Why are you such a poor friend? Why don't you have any family nearby? Why can't you make any money to, to, to buy a hotel room or something? We set ourselves up for pain. You will go through bad times in life. That's from God's word itself. In this life, you will have trouble. And then when trouble comes, we go, I'm having trouble. What happened? And God's like, I told you, you're going to have trouble. What we need to do to weather that storm is we need to have a support system. You need to be on, in the Bible so it gives you an understanding of the hard time. Hard times are coming. Why? Well, according to the Bible, it helps me grow. It helps me reach out to others who have been through hard times. A lot of things happen going through hard times. It's easier, or excuse me, we learn more to trust God through the hard times than we do the good times. If God gave you all a mansion and all the Ferraris that you wanted, you wouldn't talk to him ever again. I'm convinced of that. Most people would be like, life's good. Don't need a prayer life. Don't need to be in my Bible. Don't need to try to reach the world. Through struggle, we learn who God is and how to trust him and rely on him and we're able to relate to other people. If I grew up in a mansion and never had a struggle growing up, it's a little harder for me to connect to somebody that says I grew up poor and I'm struggling to follow God and everything. Keep that in mind. There's a purpose to the struggle. But always have a team around you. Always. When we started this church, goal number one was get a team of people to start this church. Never did I think, hey, we should start a church and I should be the only guy who's doing it. Never. One, I'm not that smart. I need people that are smarter than me in a lot of areas because they need to make up for my lack. Hopefully I make up for where they lack. But you have this team concept. What did Jesus do from the beginning? I need to call disciples. I need to call a team of people together because they're going to need each other to do the work. And so you have this idea. Never forget to build a team around you and have a support system. Life's going to get bad. And if you have nobody... You fall into depression. Things are confusing. Why does God hate me? All these things come in. It's an open door for the devil to deceive you. 
Number three, Jesus' disciples began spreading the news of his appearance after being convinced of who he is. Are you convinced of who Christ is? Have you told somebody else about it? What would that be like? Are you living in a way where you're not doing the things you used to do? Your attitude is a little better now so that people can see Christ in you. Hey, let's go do something really bad and dumb and it's going to hurt somebody. No, I really don't want to do that now. Why not? Man, I've changed a little bit. My, my mission in life has changed. My outlook is a little different. I don't want to do that stuff anymore. I want to I want to try to be a person that helps people more than whatever. It could happen when you're in school. It could happen when you're adult at work. It can happen as an elderly person. Any person in life from zero to 120 years old, spread the good news and live a life that is consistent with Christ. Jesus gave a future outlook to his disciples about what they would experience as a result of following him. Do you know that just about every disciple was murdered? That's how they died in life. They didn't live to a ripe old age and died in a canoe fishing. You know, it's like, oh, there it goes. Oh, I get to go with, be with Jesus. No, they died standing for what they believed in, and they were murdered because of what they believed in. Um, Jesus gave them a future outlook about that they would see future things you will see more miracles. And Jesus was always building in them this idea of you've got to believe in me and you've got to trust me. You guys will see all kinds of miracles and there's a purpose for those, which we will get into. Jesus has a reason for things that happen in your life. And the purpose is always to grow in knowledge and to grow in faith that we have in Christ. With that, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have given us an example. Lord, we thank you that John the Baptist was willing to step aside so that Christ could come to the forefront. Lord, he is our example. You are the example of how we are to live, who we are to look to. Everything revolves around you. We should never look to people to be our example or motivation when it comes to living the Christian life. You never fail but people do. So Lord, thank you so much for this story and this example of John the Baptist stepping aside so that people wouldn't look to him for answers, but rather to Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be faithful in what you have done for us. Help us to look to you and believe and have boldness to share you with other people. Help us to be wise and take your example and build a team around us so that when the tough times come, we can weather those because we've got a team of people that makes us stronger. Lord, we're so grateful for what you've done for us and the word that you have given us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.